Welcome to this pre-call fall semester exam review for 2016. And one of the things I love to do with you is make sure you get an understanding. And in order to uh, really get an understanding, you got to test yourself on three things. You got to make sure you remember the concepts we're working with. Second thing is you want to make sure you understand. And lastly, you actually want to go ahead and uh, and be able to apply. You need as a minimum three, these three levels of learning in order for you to successfully be able to come in and do it on your own. So if you find out that you're coming up with these solutions or results but then are not able to reproduce them, like basically do these three steps, then you got to go back and actually rewrite it, rewrite it until you get it. Now let's complete these operations. Now they're asking us for also to state the domain of each new function. Uh, we'll go ahead and do that as well. So we'll get the practice of doing so. But let's go ahead and take these both functions. The first one they want us to do is divide. So that means I'm going to take f of x and divide that with g of x. So if I do this, I could pretty easily just go ahead and write down the substitution of f of x and the solution for g of x. And one of the things I look at it is that I'm not able to divide this anymore. So because of this, the only thing that I'll be able to do is leave it in this format. This is the actual solution, but I need to state the domain. Domain on this is going to be x, where x is all real numbers. There's going to be an error right here. Anytime you have an error, like when we look at the um, denominator, which is this part here, you can look at that portion, you're going to set that equal to 0. And what that gives you the benefit of seeing is that afterwards you'll find the exact location where the errors are happening. Because you cannot have a denominator equal to 0. If you try typing, typing in your calculator the denominator, and, or any number and make the denominator divided by zero, you'll discover that you can. So here's the solution, negative five-thirds. Once you do your two-step equation, you can say domain x could be all real numbers, just cannot equal negative five-thirds. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. The next, next one they want us to multiply. So f times x, <laughs> not the... Actually, it should be between both of the other ones. So it should be f of x times e of x. So because of that, I could go ahead and do square root of x plus 2 times 3x minus 5. Now when I look at this, the only thing that you could really do to multiply this, you could FOIL it. Um, but I'm trying to think how common sense the following will be in this case. Because you really can't separate the radical. If anything, the only thing that you really could do, because this radical is really kind of like one number, you could go ahead if you needed to, like if they're looking for an alternate. This cannot be separated. So you've got to consider like one single piece, one single solution, one single number. Like imagine if I wrote 3. Like if I imagine if this was really 3, you would go ahead and divide that number there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something similar, like if I had to multiply 3, but the only thing is that we know that the result is going to be just this. So it's going to be like 3x plus 2 minus 5x plus radical 2. Now, if I look at the domain of this, actually domain on this one will be all real numbers. And the reason being is because... Um, there's really no restrictions. There's nothing here. Remember, the only time you have something that you can say domain you cannot be, well, actually, this is not true because on this one, there is certain values that x cannot be. And the way I'm realizing that is this. Remember, we cannot have negative radical numbers. You know, like we can't, have, we can't include imaginary numbers. So there's two things that we're going to do. We're going to go back to our original one and fix this one because it cannot be this number or something we're going to write similar to the other one or it cannot be any number that is uh, negative anything that is going to be x cannot be anything that is less than or equal to so x we're going to write this slightly different because um, this is writing it cannot be this number uh, we're going to write down that x is going to be everything greater than or equal to negative 2. So 
it cannot be anything less than 2 or it cannot be x cannot be so any x cannot be anything less than uh, or equal to negative 2 in this case so x needs to be all the values greater than negative 2 so there's going to be our two um, uh, things that we're going to be staying that cannot be on this one, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to write it slightly different. We're going to say domain. And mm, I would say that in our case, like when I look at the negative 5 thirds, it fits inside this. It might be best, like if you just want to encompass it, the correct domain, just to go ahead and write it this way. It'll probably be easier. And we're saying, okay, you could be, domain is just everything from negative 2 to infinity. And you cannot be, you put an and symbol, and x cannot equal negative 5 thirds. That's probably the best way to write that one. I was trying to do it using set notation, but this will this way will make more sense. And then this notation we could carry it forward. We could put negative 2 to infinity in this case. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to C. C asks us to go ahead and add them both. So we're going to do radical x plus 2. And let me go ahead, and, since you have the power to kind of see where we're, we're going back to, I'm going to erase, get some stuff moved out of the way, and just be able to focus on this part. Because our next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and discover what f of x plus g of x is. And that's exactly what that assemblage means. What is f of x plus g of x? And so what we're going to do here, let's go ahead and do this operation. That's exactly what they're looking for. We're going to do x plus 2 plus g of x, which is going to be 3x minus 5. Now, because of the way this is set up, you actually cannot simplify it anymore. Your solution on this, f plus g of x, is going to be written. We're just going to have to rewrite it in an order, kind of. That's all you could do with it. You cannot do anything else. That's it. Now this one, because of the radical, the domain still is going to be then from negative 2 to infinity. And the last portion right here, f of x minus g of x, well, it's going to be very similar to this. We're going to be describing what f of x minus g of x is. And we're going to be using uh, radical x plus 2 minus... Now, this thing is going to be important. Most people get this wrong. They don't put this in parentheses, and it has a profound effect because what it does is that we're asking for the inverse of the entire function, just not the first term. Without that, most people just put the negative in the 3. And we need it to be minus 3x plus 5. And again, so the actual uh, f minus g of x solution on this part which is be negative 3x plus radical x plus 2 plus 5 domain is going to be everything from negative 2 to infinity. So that's what the operation looks like. So there's not a lot of simplification to happen with these. So let's go ahead and move on to problem 2. Now it says right, use the following function that follows x plus 5 uh, to answer the following question. Is the point 4, 3 on the graph? Uh, there's only one way you could find it. Okay, you could bring out your calculator and type that in and discover if it's on there. That's one method. That's probably the easiest method to do it. Uh, the other method is to actually physically prove it. That means that you put in four. Um, and you know what? Let me kind of. I could go. I'll I'll do both. Because you should see for both solutions. And. Bringing out the calculator, this is what you do. You go ahead and you type in y is equal, in this case, x plus 5. Uh, I need to add this parentheses over here. And then a comma, parentheses. Uh, let's do divided by. 
x minus 1, and let's bring up the table. And we're actually looking to see if the x value is 4, it is 3. So, But if you're going to do it, you're using showing your work, because you're asking for work, it's actually done in this method. We're going to put, we're going to discover what f of 4 is and see what the output of that is. So, and to prove this 3 solution, so you do 4 plus 5. Uh, let me write that a little bit better. Or minus 1, so then this comes out being minus 3, so the solution is 3. So it actually does prove that the point is 4, 3. Now they also want to find out if x is 2, there's a solution of f of x. Like what's the output, what's the y value? So this is pretty easy. So in this case, um, we'll have f of 2. Actually, I probably want to move this over here so I have room to write this down. And we're going to have 2 plus 5, 2 minus 1. This comes out being 7 minus 1. So the solution should be 7, which means that I can prove to your guarantee your point at 2, 7. That's the point that will be on the graph. So this is the second portion that is actually asking for. So at 3, we'll have um, 3 plus 5, 3 minus 1. 8 minus 2, we'll have 4. So then that means that I can prove to you that we also have a solution at 3, 4. I love this. I love that we're able to do that. Now they want you to list x intercepts, if any, on the graph, and list any y intercepts. Now, if you're going to do this by hand, the way you discover x intercepts, they're actually discovered from the denominator, this portion here. And what you do is you make it equal to 0. Because we want to discover when that equals 0. And one of the things that we'll find out is that when you subtract 5, subtract 5, you'll be guaranteed an x-intercept at negative 5. Now, I could prove this solution using also the calculator. Can I bring up the calculator since I graphed it? I come up here, I could find out what negative 5 is and see if it's true. And it's, there it is. Here's my x-intercept. Now, the y-intercept is actually on here. See how it says 0, negative 5? I'm going to prove by hand. The way you prove that one is you go ahead and you take the equation, you set that, you set all the x's to 0. So we find out what f of 0 is, because remember, we're trying to figure out what 0 and the output is. So we'll have 0 plus 5, 0 minus 1, negative 5. Here's my y-intercept. Okay, lovely. Let's move forward to problem 3. All right, now this one they asked us to determine the intercepts domain and range, values, local maximum and minimum, and the intervals the graph is increasing and decreasing for the graph below. Now, you, when you think about these graphs, um, intercepts, most people have a good, healthy sense how to find those. Here's an intercept. Actually, let me change color so it can look a little bit better. Let me go ahead and uh, very contrasting color blue. Intercept, 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 and intercept. So like in this case, I could now prove to you that I have intercepts at negative 3, 0, negative 1, 0, negative 3, 0, 1, 0, and 3, 0. So we have these intercepts. The domain specifically is uh, where the x values exist. Now, one of the things that you could do if you're ever, like, in doubt where the domain is, is that you could box it off. This is, like, a technique that is helpful, beneficial, and useful. And you think about, it, like, if you cross all this out, this is not what the domain, this is not, everything that's crossed out is not my domain. But one of the things I'll be able to guarantee myself is that my value is roughly, well, these lines are not very straight, but... I could kind of imagine it's like negative 3.5 and negative 3.5. If I were to draw this a little bit straighter, I'll be right in the middle, right in the middle there. So one of the things I could be able to tell you is this. You could write in each in either notations, including negative 3.5 to 3.5, or some of you are used to writing in it like this, in an in equality form. Either way is fine. 
and it's actually probably useful that you're able to recognize either way. Now, as far as the range, the range is a little bit more exact. We go from negative 3, including, to 4, including. Same thing. Interval notation would just be negative 3. I mean, inequality notation. Negative 3 to y, less than or equal to 4. Now, this concept about increasing or decreasing, this by far is probably the more difficult idea of the whole thing. And one of the things, the way you could um, kind of help yourself on this to really understand this is that you got to think about x. If you think about x as time, one of the things that we know for certain is time, and I think this is probably the importance of why they want to do this. Time always goes in one direction. You always go forward. You're never able to go back. You're always traveling in one direction, this direction, in the positive direction where you're always in you're always going forward. You know, we can't try time travel backwards. And it's exactly this, how you look at the graph. You judge it on the, its increasing or decreasing intervals. For example, this is an inflection point here. This part is decreasing if I'm thinking about it as, and if you, if you think about this as money, because most people have a good sense of money, a good healthy sense of what's happening. If you think about time and you're looking like if this is your bank account, and you would think, oh, my, my, my value, my money went down. And there's an inflection point there. Here's it's increasing. Another inflection point there. Decreasing. Maybe I should color code these real quick. Give the benefit of seeing a little bit better. Okay, so here we have, uh, let's see, right over here we have uh, increasing. This is decreasing. Here's another inflection point. We go into increasing over here. Because if you notice, you're like your money value is going up. On this part over here, this is uh, decreasing. And then lastly, last inflection point states that this is going to be increasing. I'm going to write this on the outside, though, because this is, I'm running out of room there. But the thing is that now I have a good healthy sense of tell you where it's increasing. It's going to be increasing like between. And now the thing that when you write down the increasing, we don't write down like points. We write down the value, like the times. When you think about that, it's only x values that go in here. So you may want to write that out. Only x values. And this is true for both of these. Only x values are going to go here and here. So this is very important. Exclamation marks on both the sides to annotate that only x values are going to go here. So if I'm going to go and put down x values, like for the first increasing interval, this one here, okay, I will write down negative 3 to negative 2. Uh, you want to use not brackets but parentheses. And the reason being is because inflection points are not included. So there's one increasing interval. The other increasing interval was this one right here. So that goes from negative 3 to 2. Oh, not negative 3. This is where you could get confused pretty easily. From 0 to 2. And the last increasing interval was this one. So that one was from uh, 3 to 3.5. So we have uh, 3 to 3.5. Okay, I'm going to switch color and talk about the decreasing. Decreasing. So from, same thing, only x values. Negative 3.5 to uh, negative 3. And then we have it from negative 2 to 0. Same thing. If you look, it's just x values. That's where I got the 0 from. And the last increasing value is from 2 to 3. So then this is how you get those solutions. Now let's go ahead and move forward to local minimum and maximum. Now one of the things that we discover is that um, we have it in our sense that uh, if you notice, um, there's with polynomials, we have it that we have actually quite a few um, peaks and valleys. And these actually describe, one of the things that you learned is that these describe local maximums and minimums. Like for, let me color coded, maximum. I can guarantee you that that's a local maximum. That's a local maximum. And these on these graphs, 
I'll place them as local maximum. Sometimes they're called global, so just keep that in mind. But um, in this case, we're going to go ahead and point the point uh, negative 2, 3. Uh, 2, 3. And we're going to have the, mm, the other one. So the, the other one will be uh, negative 3.5. Or now this one you actually do to state in points, you know. This is actual x y points. Uh, the concept that's new is the idea that we have more than one. Most of the time you're used to quadratics and only identifying one. Now let's go ahead and do the minimums. That's a minimum. These are normally called local. That's called global. But I think in this case you're gonna actually have you list them all. So negative three zero. The uh, oh, negative three zero, positive three zero, and lastly, negative at zero, negative three. So there's my three. Lovely. So this co completes this portion of it. Let's go ahead and move on to question four. Now this one is um, something that we learned new that was called a piecewise function. And the question wants to know with interest, since interest earns in the savings accounts, investments are us, can be modeled with the equation. Now, the, what a piecewise is, is that uh, you have three equations according to the domain is the equation you use. For example, let me go ahead and, like, if you look at the equations, question one says determine the amount of interest earned in account with 2400. Well, let me point something out to you. Uh, the thing I love about it, it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Mm, okay, let me, let me go ahead and take that away. But one of the things I want to point out is that this one falls roughly right here. So here's my equation. This one is yellow. So there's my equation. So all you do is this in a very simple and efficient manner. So take 0 0.02. This is determine the amount of interest earned. Okay, so 0.02 times 2,400. So we'll discover the interest by doing this. So it's going to be 0 0.02 times 2400, and we'll discover it's 48. So this is the amount, $48 is the amount of interest earned. Now it says how much more would an account with $1,000 earn than an account with $999? Uh, they want, they're asking how much more, so it's kind of somewhat of a word problem. Uh, 1000 fits with like the yellow one. So that's at the yellow. It goes with the yellow equation. The other one, the 999, actually refers to the other, oh, the other equation right over here. This one. So one of the things that we have the benefit of doing is using both. So really what they want to know, they want to know how much more does one earn than the other comparison. So the only way we find the difference is by subtracting. So we're going to do this, 0 0.02 times 1,000 minus the other equation, which is 0 0.005 times 999.99. And the way I knew it was in this one compared to that one had to do with the little line underneath. If you notice, this one says not included. That's important to know. There's no line there. So 1,000 goes included with the other one because you see the line. So this is just going to be a calculated computation. So 0 0.20 times 1,000 minus 0 0.005 times 999.99. Nine which means my solution is uh, 15 point Zero zero five. So that's how much difference there is in money between one and the other. Now let's go ahead and explore question five. It says write the function whose graph of y equal to x but to shift the two units to the right, find units down and reflect it about the y-axis. Now we should go ahead and talk about uh, transformations. One of the things that we had the benefit of learning and you also have the benefit of seeing, apart from here in previous courses, 
is the fact that transformations work, especially with the radical. These are going to work in the sense that you're going to have uh, H and K. So like in this case, you'll have an A value here, uh, square root, a C X minus H value. Let's see, we have C, X, H, and K. Now, remember, I always perform transformations as the order of the alphabet. But more importantly, one of the things that happens is that um, two, some of these are very simple in describing. Like, for example, um, this shifts up and down. We have the experience with some of the trick that we saw that happening. This moves left to right, and it's always opposite of UC. So it's always... Um, with, you know, whatever you see in H, it's always the inverse of that amount. This uh, stretches vertically or reflects across the uh, x-axis. Uh, this one reflects, so this these both stretch. This one stretches horizontally, so this one's vertical. This is horizontal. And one of the things they want us to do is they want us to shift two units to the right so if i'm going to go to the right this becomes x minus two so that's how i get the shifting two units to the right and anytime you're in doubt just graph it and you can see if it, all these things is happening uh five units down so that's a k value so this is describes five units down and is reflected about the x-axis that's going to be the a value i'm going to put a negative there technically there's a one here since it's not important, we don't list it. So we're going to put a negative value to reflect across, to describe that reflection. Uh, it would be great if you could go back and actually see some of the reflections, practice some, because uh, I will see, I'm imagining there may be more questions about it. All right, lovely. Let's go ahead and move on to the next solution. Uh, and this is right here. Identify the parent function of the following equation, then describe all the transformations you would make to the parent function to graph the equation. Now, this is the absolute value one. It's going to be important you go back and review them. And I'm going to see, let's see if I could bring one up for you. Well, I'll bring them up. But first, I'll probably bring them up in the next video section because I'm going to run out of time. Uh, this is the transformation that's happening here. Okay. Well, first of all, this means that I shift to the left. Remember, this is always opposite of UC. Remember, this moves horizontal, but in this case, I'm moving to the left. That direction. Move to the left three units. Down one unit. I wrote the word one, but you could write the number. And then you could also, and then this actually is a vertical, this vertically affects it, so we're also going to have, let's see, we're going to have, um, it's going to be vertically stretch. By a factor two. Like this. All right. Okay, tomorrow I'll work on more of this and hopefully get more completed so we could, uh, you'll have the benefit of seeing the rest of it as well.